If you were to hop in a time machine and to jump back to a random period in Earth's history, then there is an overwhelming probability that you would find yourself in a place just like where I'm standing. The sky would be more red and I would be choking from lack of oxygen, but Lake Clifton, located an hour south of Perth, is the closest we're going to get to what Earth looked like in its distant past. These spherical living rocks, known as thrombolites, have been here for most of Earth's existence. 3.2 billion years ago, the ancestors of these thrombolites ignited the first apocalypse. They turned the skies to poison and buried the land under the longest ice age ever. Although they were eventually banished to a few select locations such as this lake, they have forever shaped life on Earth. One of the amazing things about this species is that you can be holding a two billion year fossil of one of them next to a lake full of the living example. This is a fossilized stromatolite found in North Pole, a bit west of Marble Bar in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. It's very similar to thrombolites, only the difference being that thrombolites have a honeycomb-like internal structure, while you can see the distinct layering of the stromatolite. Each of these layers was laid down by trillions of tiny organisms known as cyanobacteria. The structure grows by depositing layer upon layer of calcium carbonate, the same thing which makes up limestone. Life originally received energy from hot springs and hydrothermal vents, converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide into sugar. This worked, but it was not hugely efficient. 3.2 billion years ago, the cyanobacteria mutation appeared, which allowed bacteria to switch out its use of hydrogen sulfide over to water, which was much easier to obtain. This reaction needed a lot more energy to get started, but using the sun, there was plenty available. About 700 million years ago, a cyanobacteria made its way into a plant cell, and it's the descendants of this pair which give energy to all plants on Earth. Because there aren't many thrombolites left, we can't use them in our experiment. Instead, we're going to use an aquatic plant to help illustrate what happens when we expose cyanobacteria to sunlight. Using some ultraviolet lamps in place of sunlight, the sugar-producing parts of the plant, known as chloroplasts, are able to kick the reaction into gear. Since this reaction uses water rather than hydrogen sulfide, a new waste product is being formed, oxygen gas. If you look closely, you can even see tiny bubbles forming. These are the oxygen waste product being released into the environment. This new reaction produced 20 times more energy than the one using hydrogen sulfide. This massive advantage resulted in a population explosion of the cyanobacteria, and it's around this time that we see them forming into colonies such as these thrombolites. Restricted only by the 10 meter penetration depth of sunlight, these structures would have rapidly filled the shallow seas of early Earth. Despite all of this oxygen being produced, it wouldn't be until almost a billion years later that we first see the oxygen entering the Earth's atmosphere. What could be capturing it? What could be slowing down the oxygen apocalypse? Oxygen is an incredibly reactive substance. You can see the rusting of the bolts on this bridge. That's because of the corrosion caused by this oxygen. Before thrombolites, there was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. This meant all of the iron was in its natural form. When the oxygen did appear, this meant that the iron rusted, and it is this rusting of iron which put the oxygen apocalypse and release of oxygen into the atmosphere on hold. This is a solution very similar to Earth's early oceans. It's full of dissolved iron, which is white green in color. But what happens if we introduce in some oxygen? It took about an hour, but the solution turned red, and as you can see, these red particles sank to the bottom of the test tube. This is what is known as precipitate. It's raining rust. The same thing happened with the world's oceans. The entire planet was rusting. This is a two billion year old rock from Mount Brockman in the Pilbara. It's sedimentary, and each of these bands were laid down over millions of years. The black ones are just standard rock, which built up over time. 
the red bands are made of iron, which precipitated out of the world's oceans, when the stromatolites were producing especially large quantities of oxygen. Perth has been built on its mineral and petroleum resources, representing 20% of our total revenue. Of these is the 300 million tonnes of iron ore that are our main commodity. Of the world's top producing iron mines, Western Australia takes out seven of the top 10 spots. The Pilbara region is such an important source of iron ore because it is here that these banded layers of iron put down billions of years ago are close to the surface. The reason we don't get many fossils in WA is because the layers that may have contained them have already been eroded away. We have some of the oldest land in the world. Once all of this iron had rusted away, there was nothing to keep the oxygen trapped and it soon burst from the oceans into the planet's atmosphere. The reactivity of oxygen means that it will not only rust iron, but it also attacks living organisms. At this time, only thromombolites and their relatives used oxygen for something. Everything else was anaerobic. It didn't use oxygen to produce energy. For these organisms, free oxygen was toxic. If they couldn't bury themselves several meters into the ocean's floor, they went extinct. Oxygen also had a huge impact on global climate. I'm going to be bubbling some methane through a solution of soapy water, forming bubbles of the gas. Methane also comprised most of Earth's early atmosphere before the great oxygenation event. Already, the oxygen in the atmosphere is converting the methane into carbon dioxide. Normally, this would take about eight years, but there is one way to speed it up. Now imagine something like that on the scale of a planet. We're not sure if it did explode, but it may as well have. Almost overnight, all atmospheric methane was converted into carbon dioxide. Methane and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases. They work to trap and heat from the sun, which keeps the earth at a temperature at which water can be liquid and life can survive. Of the two, carbon dioxide is far less effective as a greenhouse gas it's a hundred times weaker. The sudden loss of this thermal blanket as methane was converted into the weaker carbon dioxide plunged the earth into its longest, most severe ice age ever. Glaciers rolled in from the poles, crushing the land and covering the seas in ice all the way to the equator. We had entered the Huronian glaciation. The first apocalypse had arrived. Eventually, increases in volcanic activity released enough carbon dioxide to end the Hanurian glaciation, allowing the kilometre-thick layers of ice to recede. The life that they revealed from its 400 million year freeze was scarred but ready to begin anew. In fact, the increased energy content of oxygen allowed life to develop, become larger and more complex. We wouldn't exist without the energy content from the oxygen released by these thromombolites. Although also surviving the apocalypse, the thromombolites would soon dwindle in number, being outcompeted by more able competition. Things like corals soon took control of Earth's oceans. Today, they are restricted to only a few locations, places like the super saline Shark Bay and the carbonate rich waters of Lake Clifton are the last refuge of a species three billion years old. If Lake Clifton is too far away from you, then the Synergy Parklands at Kings Park has some models of stromatolites on display. Eventually, this may be the only place you can see them, with rising sea levels threatening to introduce stromatolites and thromombolites to their more able competition. New episodes of Perth Science are landing every month, so make sure to subscribe to stay up to date. In the meantime, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.